A coalition of northern groups has purchased the All Progressive Congress presidential nomination, an expression of interest form for former President Goodluck Jonathan. A group comprising the Almagiris and the Pastoralists picked up the form for Goodluck Jonathan. Speaking during the event, the Secretary of the Almagiri Reform Initiative, Ibrahim Abdullahi, said Jonathan was the only one who had the policy of reforming the Almagiri system by building schools for them. During Good Luck Jonathan uh, era, he is the first president uh, since independence of Nigeria who has found it expedient, who was magnanimous enough to remember some of the most vulnerable communities in this country, the Almagiri community. We are ready not only to purchase this home for President Goodluck Jonathan, but I want to assure you that our communities, the nomadic pastoralists, has the voting power of about 9 million votes, plus the Almagiri, who also can produce about 5 million, about 14 million. All we are asking other Nigerians is to give us, give us at least 2 million, and we are home and dry. Reacting to this, former President Goodluck Jonathan has denied knowing any, any, having any knowledge about this move and categorically stated that he was not aware of this bid and did not authorize it. He made this known through his media advisor, Ike Chikueze. He however expressed appreciation for the overwhelming request by a cross-section of Nigerians for Jonathan to make himself available for the 2023 presidential election. So, it has come down to roost now. Yes, all this smoke and mirrors nonsense mm -hmm. is just an insult to our collective intelligence. I think the major lesson we have learned from silly season is that this practice of buying forms by proxy or having people try and arm twist others into running for president needs to be abolished. It's a complete joke. Mm. And with regards to um, former President Jonathan, his spokesperson issued a really strongly worded, sort of emphatic denial that he had anything to do with this, which I'm sure will come as very little comfort to everybody else who is observing how APC is really just trampling the office of the president. Mm -hmm. I've always been of the view that the office of the president should be critiqued because a president, not what, when we have heads of state, you know, appropriating that title, an actual president is one who was elected. So that's democracy. And in a democracy, those you serve have the right to critique, but that the office of the president and who occupies it must never be abused. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a line here. And it's just really quite sickening to see that those who are the current custodians of that office are the ones actually dragging it in the mud. The bar has been dropped to the ground and it's now subterranean. We're being mm -hmm. insulted as just the electorate mm -hmm. right now. And it's really actually offensive, as far as I'm concerned. All these silly games, if you want to run for president, come right out and say it. If you want to buy a form, come right out and mm -hmm. buy it. Mm -hmm. Pastoralists and our Marjorie, we all know what our Marjories are. Mm -hmm. Those children who are sent by their parents for an education and end up begging for hours in the street, are mm -hmm. those the ones who have raised 100 million naira? How? Pray tell. With the agony that those children go through. And they go from arms to arms mm -hmm. when they're recruited by terrorist organization. This is who is raising 100 million for a politician's ambition. I mean, it's a, beyond a joke at this point. Dr. Bachi. Okay, the constitution of Nigeria provides for freedom of choice. It provides for freedom of association and assembly. So certain individuals can, in their own you know, consideration, decide to come together and say, this is our choice. This is what we want to do. We have formed this assembly. You may not have committed a crime in that particular regard. Hence, we have had people coming together saying, oh, they have collected money and uh, they are buying the forms on behalf of this person. We are persuading this particular person to be president of Nigeria. What matters is what the individual, the choice that that individual makes at the end of the day. What is ridiculous about this entire process is we have had persons not showing enough character, not showing enough integrity, and pretending that, look, they are interested in the presidency of Nigeria because some people had come together and decided 
that uh, they consider that particular person the most important invention since somebody came up with the idea of a toothpick. And a toothpick must be at the lower end of inventions, I think, because you don't need too much imagination. So that's where the problem is. That's one point. The second point is that in uh, President uh, you know, Gulag Jonathan's case, this is the second time we have had him issuing a former statement. You know, through uh, Ikechuku Eze, his current spokesperson, saying that, look, he has not taken any decision either to join the APC or to run for the presidency of Nigeria. But the speculations continued, the efforts by the persuaders, both hidden and open, uh, continued. And you had all of this uh, within the public space. But I want to say, and assume perhaps, that now that you know, the uh, former president has not come up publicly to say he has nothing to do with these uh, forms that have been bought on the platform of the APC, then I guess we have enough clarity in this regard. And all the other persons who claim people have been buying forms on their behalf is their choice to make up their minds. And we hope that tomorrow we will not have a reversal of this position uh, or, you know, further speculations. In any case, the third point, which I would like to make, is that in the APC, the uh, purchase of forms, submission of forms, everything will close, I think, what's today? Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Today. Today, mm -hmm. May 10th. So by tomorrow morning, we will know who the uh, contenders are, who the uh, pretenders are, and many of the points that we have made, you know, uh, in the course of this analysis may probably become academic mm -hmm. because it's not enough to just take the forms. You must fill the forms. You must submit the forms. So it's not enough for us to, you know, become hypertensive over, oh, this person, some people have bought forms on behalf of this person or on behalf of, what does that person himself, what does he want? Does he think he's good enough to be president? Because it's not, it is not a cheap thing see a, a process where people think you can be decorated with diadems that you, you yourself, you know, you are not confident uh, that uh, you deserve. So I think in President Jonathan's case, this clarity is important. Mm. Going beyond that, I mean, I think President Jonathan himself has taken a very wise decision because there are subtextual issues. Some people have argued in the course of his name being thrown into the mix that Oh, perhaps maybe this northern ass, because, you know, it was a northern group that you referred to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they want President Jonathan to be president a second time. Um, yeah, okay, he's entitled to it. After all, in Ghana, President Mahama ran in the last election. Mm -hmm. He's going to run again in 2024. So there's that window. But the big controversy that the reference to President Jonathan has created is that Look, if you were to run again, it would shortchange the South. So if you throw all of this into the mix of this North-South, you know, uh, uh, by, uh, binary mm. uh, politics, then Southerners, there are Southerners who are saying, no, it will shortchange us because it can only do four years. Mm. And Southerners are saying, no, if a Southerner gets in there, we want to do eight years. So all of these are part of the mix, what it points to. Is our politics is not plain. I don't know whether politics is clean anywhere clean. in the world. Mm. No. <laughs> never clean. I mean, politics is never clean. Uh, but let's take some facts on ground. Everybody that has come out to say, oh, they're just putting my name in the race, they're not running. They finally emerged, and eventually they did run. Everybody. The first time President Jonathan was asked, in fact, a group of young people went to him he said, no, OK, I'll make a decision and afterwards. Now this case is coming up. The spokesperson wrote a statement. But in that statement, I didn't categorically say, I am not running for president. When I make the decision. Mm -hmm. You remember our very good friend waiting on God. But all of a sudden, we are seeing a case in court with his lawyer trying to defend him. Who is your friend? We don't have a friend here. Yeah. Okay. Everybody is fair game. Everybody is fair game, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, what is it called? Because 
It's been a subject of uh, back and forth. Everybody's the fair game. The CBN governor. Sorry, it's a local party. It's not a, everybody's fair game. The CBN governor. So that was saying, I'm waiting on God for a while. And after waiting on God, he's not still officially declared. But all of a sudden, what is happening? His lawyer is in court trying to defend 8412 and Section 137 and say, no, he's got a chance. He's got a right to run. But as of today, he's not made a declaration. Because even when the forms were bought for him, remember what he said. That he was going to buy it with his own money, 35 years hard earned money. But all of a sudden, voila, his lawyer is in court. And we've not seen a declaration yet. And as all of this was going on yesterday, President Goodluck Jonathan was seen meeting with the chairman of the APC. So when you put summations together, we'd like to wait till the end of today and see more drama because nobody saw this drama coming on. We'd like to see how this pans out. But for me, the formative word is everybody that has said, oh, I've got nothing to do with this race. They're in the race, just like the attorney general with the, state of, uh, with, with the case of KB. Guandu, his spokesperson too, came out to refute those claims about running for KB, despite the fact that we saw videos of him speaking about his ambition in KB, he came out flatly to deny it. Second point is, let's stop taking Nigerians for a ride. The country is too sensitive at this point for people to think the presidential election is a jamboree. If you want to come out, beat your chest, be bold. Come out, hit your chest and say, I am running for president. Stop all these games. It looks childish. Worst case scenario, you flog that out of the polls and the primaries. If those that are supporting you are strong, they'll support you till the very end. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. Because it is this personal deceit that has gone on and on and on. A lot of people are even positing that it would tilt the balance. Like Dr. Abati said, the four-year dichotomy, the fact that he can't run more than four years. Some people are even saying maybe, just maybe, he's the anointed candidate. That some people want to use. That's why it's dead in the race. So let's see how this goes. But how can we remove President Jonathan's visits to the chairman of the APC yesterday night, between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., as reported by the newspaper, with the purchase of funds? It's a tedious link. Somebody explain it to me. And I have to well, differ on that point you made about mm. this discussion being academic. I feel that the louder the protest on behalf of our democracy, no less, Dr. Batsy. No, I say it's the, academic. The greater the, yeah, because of APC selling the At the end the of forms. the process. Yeah, selling, yeah. The, ending the sales of forms today. No, but I feel that the louder the protest now, the greater the chance that we get of having this reflected in the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, which I'm sure will come in the next um, National Assembly. Yeah. We have to ban this proxy form yeah. situation. Yeah. It's People embarrassing. Can raise, you can raise any issues. Uh, the uh, legal framework for any process is evolutionary, and laws are made for people based on their experience. In any case, with regard to the statement by Ikechuku Eze, mm. I thought it was clear enough uh, because, uh, you know, the statement says categorically that President Jonathan was not aware of this bid and did not authorize it and that uh, he has not in any way requested or committed himself to this request. That's a statement in the public domain. We will hold uh, that, you know, as the evidence yes. before us. And I do not expect that uh, a former uh, president of Nigeria, member of the uh, Council of State, and a man of uh, President Jonathan's uh, stature would, in the next 48 hours, you know, uh, come forward and say he did not say this because there's no way that statement could have gone out without his affirmative approval. I mean, let, let's we we'll wait and see. We we'll wait and see. Let, let's see how this part. A federal high court in Abuja has ordered the Independent National Electoral Commission, the Attorney General of the Federation, to appear in court uh, and show cause why Central Bank Governor Godwin Emefile should not be allowed to keep his job as CBN Governor while seeking election into the office of the President. Justice Muhammad made the order after MFLA's counsel, Michael Zekome, asked the court to grant an order for all parties to maintain status quo antebellum, which will enable MFLA to keep his job. Zekome had argued that MFLA, being a public servant, is governed by Section 137 1G of the 1999 Constitution, which allows public servants to resign from office not later than 30 days from the date of the election. 
He consequently prayed the courts to grant an injunction to protect the Mephila's interest. The case was adjourned to Thursday, 12th May 2022, for the defendants to show cause as why the order for maintenance of status quo antebellum should not be granted and subsequent rulings on the motion for abridgment of time to fast track the proceedings. Tundu, this is just what we're saying. Not declared yet. Yes, I haven't said it's not exactly. So he's clearly interested. And by his own standard, this is most unfortunate because one of his vehement denials, he said he does not want to be distracted. I think that was a hashtag mm -hmm. that he tacked onto the end of a tweet that he issued. So how can a presidential race be anything less than a distraction? This is what happens when standards are allowed to fall, when the bar is subterranean. This is what happens when you have ministers of the Federal Republic running a campaign, and they have not resigned. The CBN governor now thinks he can also get a look in. It's really unfortunate. The credibility of the CBN and its independence strictly relies on avoiding any kind of partisan politics. And I'm sure that this should be a given. Can you imagine Janet Yellen saying that, oh, because I've done so well in the Fed, I'm now going to run, or people are buying her forms. I don't know, who did she give a bailout? Because you gave us a bailout and you supported our sector, we're going to buy you forms. You're going to run, run, run as a Democrat, which she is a Democrat. Mm -hmm. But can you, can you begin to imagine that? I remember one statement that she gave talking about inequality in society, and she was roundly lambasted. And she has never tried that again. Even that was too political mm -hmm. as the chair of the Fed to utter from her mouth. It's not done. I think uh, Mr. Mefiele is well within his rights, according to the Constitution, to run. But for crying out loud, just resign. Not just him. Not just him. Everybody who is in any way involved in public service should take the example given by others and resign. This is an issue I have with the APC leadership, especially the president, who is the leader of his party. The lights are on, but nobody's at home. If everybody beneath you is running amok all over the place, then the responsibility is on you to bring order to what we're now seeing is as complete chaos. And then going to court also just is, for me, is another indictment, a soft indictment, because not everything that is legal is moral. Yes. There's a long list of it. Yes. If you have any interest at all in preserving all the credibility that he has built. This is Mr. Mefere, having made history as um, two-time CBN governor. Resign. Simple. And run. No, I have no further comments on this. I've done um, an extended commentary on it. I, I'm sure it's there somewhere in the mm. public domain. I have no further comments. So concerning this, it goes back to what we keep saying. We have to have honor. We have to have integrity. We have to have a sense of being able to stand for what we believe in. If your convictions are that you want to run for president, do the needful. What is the moral stance on still keeping an office that you know wields a lot of power that can even affect the presidency race? Just like the case of the Attorney General, too. That office is quite very powerful. You know, I didn't know how much powers there were until I took out time yesterday while I was trying to find sleep from my ordeal. But I started reading Bofia Act. There's a Section lot of, 18. Yeah. There's specifically. A, there's a lot of power in the CBN. And if you still keep that office, and you run against other people in the contest, it's not a fair balance. So the best thing is, there's nothing wrong with him saying he wants to run for president. Of course not. But he can't keep that seat, just like a lot of people talk about the ministers and the attorney general. There's a level of unfairness. And with all due respect, I'd like to disagree with Femi Fallon here that talks about, oh, they could take a leave of absence. They shouldn't even take a leave of absence. Get out of the place, come into the race. And we have seen governors do this in different, look at Governor Okowa of Delta State. Led by example, he told people that you're distracting me in my cabinet. If you have ambition, go. And he sacked all of them. That should be the way to go. So we can have a fair race. I've got nothing against the ambition of CBN Governor MFL, he can't run. He's a Nigerian. He's got the right to run for presidency. But we must be fair to all. And it is that fairness that makes a lot of people shout. So we'll see how this pans out in court. It's up on Thursday. That's all on News LA. We'll take a short break.
when we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, uh, Aaron to give us updates on Africa global business, sporting activities. Uh, stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rota Sidiri, who is in a very giggly mood this morning, <laughs> doctor, is doctor, here so with his laugh. Africa business update. Yes, good, good morning. morning. Good morning to the good morning, doctor. Good morning, Rufai. You no know, uh, Shane. No yeah, hey, hey, you know we got to do. Don't mind my voice. Okay, <laughs> I don't mean any harm. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Moma, we start with Moma, the major oil marketers of uh, Nigeria. I thought they put out a really, really good press release yesterday, just explaining the jet fuel crisis. Um, to Nigerians. They started out apologizing, empathizing with everybody, private vehicle owners, logistics and transport companies, manufacturers, cooking gas users in homes, all members of the public. It was, I don't know, I think it was almost presidential. But here's the second page. This is very key here in what they're talking about. Just looking at uh, the highlight that he said, during this period of the NNPC intervention, that is in the jet, in for jet fuel with respect to the airlines, as NNPC, that's the state oil company, uses the nominal CBN exchange rate of 416 to the dollar, no independent importer would import aviation fuel as it is unable to access foreign exchange at the same rate, leaving the NNPC as the major importer of aviation fuel for now, even though the product is deregulated. In comparative terms, the aviation industry is already benefiting from government intervention when local prices are compared to West African regions. They put up Ghana and I think Sierra Leone, where it's much higher there. So essentially, when you look at everything that's going on right now, and I know they had a meeting yesterday, we're waiting to get their uh, updates. This is, there's a you know, foreign exchange dynamic, which they've clearly um, laid out um, for everyone. And until that is addressed, well, uh, you know, unless the f uh, federal government is going to allow oil marketers to be able to uh, get uh, bringing the product at that exchange rate, well, that's um, that's going to remain pretty complex as far as the uh, as far as they're concerned. Um, from uh, from airlines, we go to the automotives. Um, the NADDC, uh, National Automotive uh, uh, Design Development Council, is uh, readying, uh, prepping to, to about 200 billion naira for vehicle financing. This has been on the cards for uh, quite a while. Uh, and essentially what they're looking at uh, is to provide single digit interest rates to Nigerians that want to get brand new vehicles, just like it's done in, in South Africa or uh, in, 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 in uh, Algeria, wherever, and other African nations where you can actually you don't even have to own the vehicle, you know, own it outright. You just put a down payment of 10, 10%. You drive it for a couple of years, can lease it and then return it if you like, and it's sold to somebody else. So there's a huge benefit here from as far as savings for disposable income for people who wouldn't have to, you know, have to save for years to be able to buy a new vehicle. So uh, the issue though is going to be how they are able to get those single digit interest rates with the banks that they're going to be working with to allow you know, employed working Nigerians to be able to afford um, a, a brand new vehicle. And of course, the next thing from this is housing. I mean, that's another huge thing where we've got a mortgage market that, you know, you know, what's the Nigerian dream? Is it to own a nice little house, you know, and raise a family? The cost of, of that, being able to get an affordable mortgage and pay it off over time. So we'll see how this goes. Again, the uh, in local parlance, the cocoa of the matter is whether or not they're going to be able to secure those single digit rates with banks who will, you know, willingly finance this measure. Uh, we'll see how it goes. JP Morgan um, has uh, put out an interest, a research note yesterday or the day before talking about how the Federal Reserve is and the Federal Reserve's rate hikes are harmful to emerging markets and they actually singled out Nigeria and a couple country, other countries in their research note that they put out for their investors so I think here is um, just a summary of what exactly what exactly was. if you look at this they said the Federal, Federal Reserve is a risk to emerging markets they said about the emerging markets uh, bond index is down 16% year to date, and of course includes, you know, essentially um, the index tracks the number of emerging market indexes around the world, countries basically with sovereign debt. They say $4 billion in net outflows from emerging markets since just the middle of April. So that is funds have been coming out of emerging markets and going back to developed markets as a result of the Federal Reserve raising rates. Nigerian sovereign debts, they removed it from overweights. So, Basically, when you think of a portfolio, you can, uh, if you have 100 naira in your portfolio and 80 naira of that portfolio is going towards one particular security, you're overweight that, port port um, you're overweight that security because you're allocating a larger balance of your portfolio towards that. So, so taking a look at that list now, they've removed Nigeria from overweight. So they are telling investors that, look, the reason why is because, and this is key, JP Morgan, I think, is one of the first 
uh, asset managers that has pointed out the fact that NNPC has not been remitting money over to the Federation accounts. And as a result of that, Nigeria has uh, structural issues in terms of possibly paying back her debt. And that has now affected what the outlook for her sovereign, her sovereign debt. So they removed it. They replaced Nigeria with Serbia, shout out to Novak Djokovic, and uh, Uzbekistan. And they basically said that those countries uh, now they put them in the overweight category, saying that they have a fiscally cautious government which have larger reserves, even with the issues that have been that are going on with um, Ukraine and Russia. So there's a lesson to be learned there. So basically, what it is that hey, we've removed Nigeria from overweight, and we're telling investors, you know, re re reduce your exposure to Nigerian debt, put it in Serbia put it in Uzbekistan, which is a basically telling you that there's competition for funds around the world, and these are the kind of things that investors are looking at. There's a quote, in fact, let's put up the um, quote from JP Morgan. Nigeria's fiscal woes amid a worsening global risk backdrop have raised market concerns despite a positive oil en environment. I want to I want to compare this to a quote from something we talked about back in March. A gentleman called uh, Edward Gutierrez. Back when it was Turkey and Nigeria were approaching the bond markets, this is what he said. He said Nigeria and Turkey are having to pay off to get their deals done now in a choppy market. To me, the bigger surprise is Nigeria, given the oil windfall they are currently enjoying. At this time, I was like, what is he talking I about? Oh, exactly, right? I was scratching my head at which oil windfall. So between that March and, and May now, you can see JP Morgan pointedly going and saying, okay, look, this is the issues and this is how basically Nigerians' um, revenue issues can actually impact us. Now, despite this, here's something else on the flip side. Let's talk about the stock markets. Despite emerging market funds going to developed markets, take a look at this. Nigeria currently is the fifth best performing stock market in the world. These are the top five according to Bloomberg's World Equities Index. Number one is the BIST in Turkey, up by 34.5%. That is their year-to-date return so far. Number two is also Turkey, the uh, BIST 100. These are indexes that track the uh, largely weighted stocks on their exchanges. 33.04. Kuwait is in third place with their KWSE Premier Market Index, 22.2%. Tadwal, Saudi Arabia, 21.74%, and Nigeria. So now, Top five equities in the world are from Turkey, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Nigeria, which is kind of interesting because Turkey, for instance, Michael Wilson has talked about Turkey extensively. Look at this headline. Turkey's stock market hits record high. Turkey is experiencing major economic problems, but the Istanbul Stock Exchange continues to rise. There is some disconnect between some equity markets and their economic fundamentals. But I mean, I mean look at Turkey. Um, Monetary policy is upside down, right? Yeah. Interest rates, I'm sorry, um, inflation is at an all-time high. The lira is down, but Erdogan continues to reduce interest, interest rates. rates yeah. Right? But Turkey exports iron ore, they export steel. So maybe increasing commodity prices is allowing them to benefit. Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, oil benefits and so on. But the Nigerian Stock Exchange, look, as I've said before, there are certain stocks on this on our exchange that are wealth builders, from the banks um, to the industrials, um, to oil and gas. Um, Seplat, for instance, um, has hit a new all-time high of 1,200 naira. When oil goes up, Seplat goes up. That is yeah. the correlation. May, March 2020, Seplat was at 300 naira a share. It's not at 1,200. If you, that is a 4X. If you put a million naira in, in Seplat in March of 2020, that million naira investment in Seplat stock is now worth 4 million naira. MTN just yesterday, the day before, need to hit a new all-time high of 250 naira a share, I think, perhaps because of the final approval received uh, for 5G and other things. So, I mean, it's not the entire exchange, but setting stocks, if you mm -hmm. pinpoint them, they're, they're wealth builders. And you know why that is happening? <clears throat> There's a rush on the market. Why? Because those shares are easy to get, they have reduced the price. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Yep, they say so, they're undervalued. Yeah. So they are really undervalued. And when you see an undervalued share, what do you do? You make Pick a running for it. Pick it up. So a lot of people will go straight to those shares and make a running for it. Look at Turkey. Mm. The economy is way down. The currency way down. Lira is taking a beating. Mm -hmm. Tremendous beating. Inflation high. When inflation high, what does it do? Cuts the viability of the currency. Right. So a lot of people are targeting those stocks. So it is expected. Mm. Second thing, you see where physical indiscipline has led us? Because the clear problem of Nigeria is that of physical indiscipline. We are paying what I call moribund subsidies. Right. The poor man on the street doesn't enjoy the subsidy. It is still the rich you're subsidizing petrol for. It is still the rich that drives a 4x4 four four mm. that can load up his 80-litre tank for 15,000, 16,000 It is the rich you're subsidizing that for. And when you do that... The money you ought to spend for the poor, you can't spend it because that $4 trillion is creamed away through various channels. Mm. 
Coupled with that, mm -hmm. we are still subsidizing aviation fuel. Yep, as because, that, moment, because that's yeah. what we have done. Yeah. You know, I told you yesterday, yeah, you, did. you see, Nigeria is so almost predictable. I said they were going to kick the down, count down the road. When they had the meeting yesterday, they said they were going to give them 6 million liters at the rate of 480. Mm. Who pays the rebate on the landing cost? Right, that's the More cost for us. Right. Nobody has been able to tell us where that cost on the landing cost, the rebate will go to and who will pay it. And that's a very temporary measure. Yeah, Take, last. for instance, an average plane will use between 2,500 liters to 5,000 liters for one trip, for right. one one-hour trip. Divide that, the 6 million liters they want to give among oh, 11 airlines. airlines. One airline just gets over 500,000 liters. Mm. And 500,000 liters divided by how many one-hour trips? 5,000. You just get about a couple hundred one-hour trips. Mm. So it's a soft measure. And the long-term problem has not been solved. They still came back to the long-term problem we talked about. Maybe when we build refinery. Maybe when Dangote comes up. <laughs> maybe when this and all of that happen. Yeah. The solution is there. Let us do the hard work today to enjoy tomorrow. We should stop being indisciplined. We have created more debt for ourselves. That's the truth. But the solution is there. The solution for fiscal indiscipline is physical discipline. Shake it now. Well, uh, Rotus. Yes. You Doctor. know, I've been on this subject. You have. Aviation for well, Yep. Since Sunday. <laughs> yes. Yesterday, <laughs> yes. despite the fact that I said there was a, a deregulation of, uh, you know, aviation fuel in the downstream sector. Oh, you said, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I was wrong to yeah. have said it's an NPC. Mm. Now, I think I've been vindicated <laughs> yes. because in this statement by the Major Oil uh, Marketers yes. Association of Nigeria, at uh, paragraph four, yes. they pointed out that although there is deregulation, that it is in fact the NNPC that has still been enjoying a monopoly. You so are that's a footnote, yes, sir. you know, to what you said yesterday. Come yeah. back again, <laughs> again, again. <laughs> <laughs> but to go further, yes, sir. This whole issue is about foreign exchange uh, problem. Mm. Moman is saying, mm. and we have been on this issue. Foreign exchange uh, crisis, monetary policy is not a problem only for oil uh, importers or the downstream sector. It's a, it's a problem for everybody. Correct. If you sent a child, a daughter or a son, uh, to the UK, maybe about six, seven, eight years ago, the money you paid to send three children to school. Today now, it will be the same cost for four children. Mm. Many families have withdrawn their children from schools abroad. It's the same thing. Even at home. So some, some of these, uh, you know, home managers, let me use that phrase, <laughs> because Tunu is already looking at me. Those of them who charge in uh, Forex, it, it's a problem for yeah. household, household, household uh, management. That charge in Forex? <laughs> How much Myra can you provide to keep uh, to keep life going? Okay, so this is the problem that we face. So, and we go back to that same old question about the foreign exchange system in Nigeria. Mm. How do you manage it? Yesterday, you yourself uh, concluded that in the end we will be all be dead. In the long and run, you you made a suggestion, I think, yesterday about local refining. Mm. I won't be surprised if somewhere down the line now that line where they are kicking the can that. Uh, Rufai was refi referring to. They will say, oh, it's Dangote refineries that will solve the problem. They said it too. Okay. They said it. So yeah. will Dangote refineries <laughs> solve the problem of foreign exchange? That is that about that. Yeah. The second thing is about this uh, vehicle financing thing. Yes. That uh, engineer uh, Delilah uh, Liu, yeah. Liu uh, was talking about. Okay. They say they want us to now have, uh, you know, support system, uh, single digit uh, interest rate to be able to buy a uh, Brand new cars. Brand new cars. Yes. Okay, I think the National Automotive uh, Development uh, Commission, yeah, has to be seen to be saying something. But is that the priority of Nigerians at this moment? Good question. Good question. The big priority is that Nigerians just want an economy that works. They are looking forward to a president by next year who can address all the problems that Nigerians have. They just want this cost of living crisis that has shown up in different aspects of the economy to be resolved. And it is not enough for MoMA uh, uh, or anybody else to say, oh, uh, we should stop talking about cost of living crisis because it's a global problem. Mm. Demand and supply disruptions, the war in Ukraine and all that. Well, everybody should use their brains because that was how Raja, Raja Pasca, the uh, prime minister 
and the president. That was what we were seeing in uh, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, yeah. Yeah. up to a point that we have had weeks, months of protests in Sri Lanka, and now yesterday. Uh, the uh, the brother who is the uh, prime minister has had to to resign. <laughs> His okay? brother and yeah. the, the big problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's a political uh, yeah, dynasty. He's a political they dynasty. have His Sri, president Sri Lanka, and prime minister. And, and the know. Philippines, the daughter is so running. So the, yeah, the yeah. big fear, mm. as has been pointed out by the Bretton Woods institutions, that if countries are not careful, mm. this uh, emerging markets that you refer to, if they're not careful, they will they will pay the cost yeah. of this uh, global destruction in terms of political instability right. and social disruption. Yep. And that's why all of us have to be careful. Mm. And why we have to focus on getting intelligent people, buying force, and uh, passing the screening process yeah. so that we can have uh, a better country. Preach it, Dr. Preach it, preach it. <laughs> Thank you, Reuters. Thank you so much. Thank go. you so much. I'll send you a WhatsApp. Of course, of course. <laughs> Moving on to more business update, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, global stocks taking uh, having their worst day since June 2020. Uh, not lost on the Asia Pacific markets, which were all down. Hong Kong listed shares of Chinese tech companies, uh, in particular like Alibaba and uh, Tencent, down quite considerably yesterday. NetEase down nearly five percent. The, the message coming through is that these tech companies, the huge valuations, can't really cope with the fact that people are worried about growth and worried about inflation and so on. And it stretched to Japan as well. Shares in SoftBank, which has uh, global tentacles everywhere, really. Um, the broader picture is that uh, uh, it's going to remain higher bond yields, tighter monetary policy, and that doesn't really um, that doesn't really favour uh, tech stocks. Um, and Southeast Asia, you were talking about developing economies, I think, earlier on. Southeast Asia may face um, uh, social unrest. I mean, I think what they're talking about is rioting there. Um, if uh, the high prices of food continue, um, and it, for example, and, and th th this is this poorer um, countries and poorer families, more importantly, pay a larger proportion of their disposable income into food. Um, let's look at the Philippines, for example. According to their statistics authority, um, the households there spent nearly 40, 40 percent of their disposable income on food. In the United States, it's about um, 8 percent. As you were mentioning, Sri Lanka's Prime Minister uh, resigned yesterday. Um, I won't take you through all the family ramifications there, but um, protesters across the island uh, you had a lot to say about that. They've been having a lot to say about the rising cost of living and the conduct of that particular family and how it's been running the economy for a long time. Um, it's hard hit by the pandemic, rising oil prices, rising fuel, fuel prices. So there is now um, martial law there. Um, the government, as we were saying last week, has approached the International Monetary Fund. They are currently in talks with that about a possible bailout. As far as the United States is concerned, well, it was a you know really a, a rock and roller, rough and tumble day yesterday, and exactly the same kind of thing that you think. I'll talk about one stock, Apple, for example, um, amongst tech stocks that's lost over two hundred billion dollars in total. The sector they think of tech stocks around the world has lost about a trillion dollars. Uh, whereas people going into things like yes, Campbell Soup. Um, General Mills and also J.M. Smucker. Uh, they are seen as defensive stocks in the United States and therefore um, people have actually been looking towards those U.S. stock futures. Slightly positive this morning, but I suspect that's only because of the, the drops um, yesterday. Uh, and it's down, the, the total market's down about 17% from its 52-week high. Um, again, uh, very, very much an average kind of figure, but that's the kind of thing that's happening to stocks in the United States at the moment. Um, the EU has dropped its ban on shipping Russian oil. Uh, now, this is not to do with importing, but actually shipping it because of objections from the EU's main uh, flag holders, which are Malta um, and Greece. Uh, they have about 45% of European shipping under their flags, and so they are unsurprisingly against that. Hungary, now this is the ban on importing oil, is still sticking with it. its ban on the ban, if you like. They, they still want to uh, import Russian oil because um, it'll, actually, it'll actually service their economy better, given its price at the moment, and they don't want to let it go, basically. Although 
Officials are, are, officials are still saying, as I was saying yesterday, that there may be some compromise ahead. Who knows? Uh, UK economy, one of the most vulnerable in the world. Now, you were talking about this business of having things now, having cars at a cheap price, having housing at a cheap price and so on. We in this country have these things called mortgages, which you know all about, but these are relatively short-term mortgages and no surprise here. As soon as um, interest rates start to rise, and they have been doing rather rapidly in this country, then those short-term mortgages become very, very expensive for people and it cuts away at disposable income. So that's a, a fairly simple formula. The thought is longer-term mortgages might be might be an answer to that, but uh, com companies and banks and so on uh, are unwilling to do that. Um, and uh, that really is, oh yes, we're going to have the Queen's speech today, which is going to be read by Prince Charles. Um, you can expect to see a lot of supposed help for the high streets, a lot of supposed help for disposable incomes against rising prices, quite what's going to be suggested. I don't know. I have to say I'm fairly fatalistic about these kind of things, but somebody somewhere along the line thinks as though there's going to be a kind of solution to that. UK shoppers don't think that. They have actually reduced re retail sales down 0.3%. doesn't sound a lot, but on an, on an economy, as most modern economies are based upon consumer uh, performance and consumer confidence, um, th this is quite important. And, con and consumer confidence is now being crushed by all the usual factors, higher cost of living and all the rest of it, higher energy prices, and also maybe, maybe just some of that kind of that that feeling that the growth around the world and recessions looming and the rest of it may well be hitting all countries not that that worries you when you go down to the supermarket but it's all part of the picture and thus finally um oil prices down about one percent on all those kind of things a highlighting of recession um china slow down and so on and the fact that that during the victory march, President Putin declined to declare an official war on Ukraine. Now, some of us may rejoice in that and let's hope there's a peaceful ending and all those kind of things. But actually, the oil price, therefore less risk, fell down as a result of all those factors. That's the global view. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. I I'd like to ask, very sadly, I should say, when will this recession hit the UK? And I ask that because you're already having problems with mortgage, we all remember 08 in America, subprime mortgage crisis. The defaults are starting. What will be the cascading effect of the default on the British economy, especially short-term mortgages? And secondly, then what's the solution to, uh, what do you think will be the solution to Sri Lankan problem now since the PM has gone? Mahinda of Rajapaksa, one of the Rajapaksa uh, brothers, uh, has, has left. I have absolutely no idea what the solution to the Sri Lankan problem is. It may be talking to the IMF. It may be talking to our, a short-term loan. I've said in the past it's very, very difficult to put together a country like Sri Lanka, which was doing rather well until this decade of mismanagement. Um, I caution that the IMF... Well, it sounds like a good idea, but they are very, very strict about what they do. I draw your attention to the Greek finance crisis only 10 years ago, I think it was. Uh, and look look what happened there. Look how tight they were on, on those kind of controls. It took a long time for that to come right. It may take a long time for Sri Lanka to, to, to come right as well. But, I, you know, day to day, I don't know what the solutions are. No, no more, no more than anybody else. I mean, what, what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, th there will be a new PM there and no doubt the new prime minister will talk about returning to the days of prosperity. How on earth they do that? I do not know. Uh, as far as recession in this country is concerned, well, we'll wait till that's officially uh, given out. Uh, the, the difference between what happened in the United States as far as uh, rubbish mortgages being bundled up and, and sold on, um, and the film to watch about that is The Big Short, which is actually, it is semi-fiction, but it's got some very, very good metaphors which help explain what was going on there fairly simply. We're not at the moment, as I understand it, seeing those short-term mortgages which are in default, such as they are, A, we don't know what the numbers are, and B, we're not seeing them bundled up, as I understand it, into financial assets, or non-assets, as I would call them, but no doubt the world calls them assets, uh, like they were in the United States. So that hasn't happened yet. I feel as though, though, the cost of living is really going to strike uh, when, 
when the uh, when we when we get this the second round of energy price increases, which will be in the autumn, then I think you'll see recessionary factors. You'll see people not spending a lot, and that's really what a recession in this country would be. It would be people actually not using their disposable income to have fun and enjoy themselves, and 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 also they're cutting back on um, on on things like food and so on. That that really will be the effect of recession, and that will carry through as smaller companies lose their customers. That hasn't begun. That hasn't happened yet. Um, I'm not saying that the, the seeds of that aren't happening. Again, we've got these very, very clumsy things that we all use with central banks, which are called interest rates. And I happen to think that they are very, very clumsy instruments. But until somebody comes up with something else, um, We'll, we'll just see. I mean, it's how interesting, isn't it, that you were talking about Turkey earlier on in the programme, how the stock market's hitting records, and yet what a Humpty Dumpty policy they have there. Well, quickly, first, Sri Lanka. Mahindra Rajapaksa, you know, has had to uh, submit his letter of resignation to his brother. Uh, is this the Rajapaksa family trying to play games? Because, you know, before now, uh, the president himself uh, had to uh, rejig the cabinet, appoint new persons as part of the process with uh, uh, the money they are looking for from the IMF, from India, and the help they are seeking uh, from uh, China. So is this part of the game? And who will go next? Will it be President Rajapaska himself? Now, from uh, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Bombong, uh, Marcos Jr., Ferdinand Marcos Jr., uh, were told that in the exit polls with about uh, 96% of the votes having been counted, that is likely to get over uh, 40 uh, million of the votes and win. And the vice, in the vice presidential election, Sarah Duterte, the uh, daughter of uh, the man that is living as president, is likely to be the vice president. But what should we expect going forward in Philippines? Uh, the Marcos family, uh, you know, making up, you know, rewriting history, reversing the course of history and uh, restoring uh, the Marcos family, or are we likely to get some seriousness uh, from uh, Bumbung uh, uh, Marcos uh, Jr.? And finally, Elon Musk, uh, Hindenburg uh, Research is saying that, uh, look, he may ask for a review of what uh, he proposed, 44 billion, because his stocks of uh, Twitter, you know, uh, have been going down. I bet you will have to pay a penalty of $1 billion if he walks away. Uh, are we expecting more drama in that direction? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of course we are. He thrives on drama. I've got no idea which way that's going to go. And personally, uh, and I, I don't think anybody's particularly concerned about it. it, makes good headlines. It's so far out of the majority of people's thinking where Twitter goes. I wouldn't touch Twitter with a barge pole personally, but um, people do want to get on it. It is a no, no question. It's a global phenomenon and it's a global phenomenon of, 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 of comment. Um, Fine. I mean, if that, you know, which way to, the important thing about it's not so much about Elon Musk. It's really I mean, yes, you're right about the, the penalty for walk, walking away is a billion dollars. However, uh, what we haven't heard from him, as I understand, it, is how he intends to monetize Twitter, uh, which is the most important thing. How on earth do you make something like that make money? And how do you also uh, defend it against the considerable amounts of regulation that it's also going to get? As I was saying previously, I have no idea about Sri Lanka at all. All I can say is that it may be that there's further dramas to come. I did say that the Prime Minister would go. What do I know about these things? What does anybody know? Um, it's a strange, it's, it's, a, it's a very strange country and, and it's, the mismanagement has been absolutely manifest. The Philippines are interesting um, how, how interesting is it not that the ruling family actually debunked, didn't they, in the, um, was it the 1990s, I think, went to Hawaii, Ferdinand Marcos died in 1998, Emelda Marcos and her daughter uh, and Bong Bong uh, decided to firm their base up in Hawaii and now he's gone back and he will no doubt, he will no doubt be promising the sort of prosperity and he'll be re reviving the Marcos um, the, the, the Ferdinand Marcos benefits to the community, uh, to the to, to the country. If you think they are, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Uh, but that's what they'll be doing, and he'll be promising um, decades of, of prosperity coming up. In what is, let's not forget this: Philippines is not one of the Asian tigers. It's in the second division of Asian Tigers, but it's about the fourth in that second division. So it's a considerable economy. And it's like one of those one of those things in that kind of area. We'd very much like it to do well. Um, it's got a huge amount of agriculture, which is probably not a great idea. 
But what it does very successfully is it makes a lot of money from outsourcing professional um, professional financial services, uh, or rather you dealing with outsourced professional financial services. It's, it's, it's bigger than India in that. So there's a lot of potential there. It's a question like anything else of dealing with it properly. Right. Um, my question for you, uh, Mr. Wilson, is about the, the EU um, ban on Russian oil. What happens if Hungary continues withholding their support? Can the EU no, that, actually that, veto yeah, that, that, that one holdout? So that's a very good question. I, again, all I can do is I'm reading this in the same way that you are, and I understand that the message from the EU is there is still some negotiating wiggle room there. So maybe Hungary will not be the only one that stands out, and Hungary will get under, it'll, it'll be under pressure from other um, fringe members of, of the EU. EU as well. So there's no question about that. I think far more worrying is what is the EU actually um, giving in to Greece and Malta about actually shipping, using ships uh, to, to carry uh, Russian oil export, because that would be quite an effective ban. Then you would put a stranglehold on those exports. But because, um, because Malta and Greece um, own so much uh, of, of the EU tonnage of ships, I think it's 43, 43 to 45%, something like that, um, then, then that, that, that's, that's much more serious. I suspect pressure will be brought to bear on Hungary. Very difficult to do that on Greece and Malta as they are in charge of that amount of shipping. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Wilson.